All righty, you're on. Hello, America. Uh, Dr. Stella Emanuel here today uh, on the Dr. Stella Emanuel Show, where um, Bible science and current events meet. I'm really grateful to be talking to you today, and today's uh, message is going to be teaching you about prayer. We have actually been putting together a prayer movement where people are joining us from all over the country to pray. And uh, we say if you text PRAY to 53445, it will take you to my website um, that will give you my, my book, 10 Point Plan to Disciple America Back to God. And I want you to get that book because he has prayers and everything. So um, why do I feel like in this season we have to pray? Before we go, let me just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this program. I thank you for taking control over this broadcast in the name of Jesus. I covered it broadcast with the blood of Jesus to the fire of the Holy Ghost. And I pray that anybody listening to me, that the veil will be taken off their minds that they will see the glorious light of the gospel. And that light will shine in their hearts and they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. I come against the spirit of fear and I cancel their assignment over people in this season in Jesus' name. Amen. And like I said, today I really want to teach on prayer, warfare prayer to last, you know, because... Um, We've been talking about it's time for war and uh, a lot of Christians are not aware of the fact that as a Christian, as a child of God, one of the things that God has given us is the ability to pray and change things in the spirit. So I'm going to be doing a, a, a little teaching right now on how to pray in this season, not just pray the cute prayers, but pray in a, in a way that is effective. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much. So in this teaching, we're going to start in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to turn to Ephesians 6 and read it. Ephesians 6 says, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles or the tricks of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you'll be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loin guts with about with the truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you can quench the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18, very important. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, Apostle Paul is saying here that we should pray all prayers. We should pray all kinds of prayers. We should pray warfare prayers. We should do praise. We should do supplications. We should do intercession. We should do judgmental prayers. We should do prayers for mercy. So we need to pray all kinds of prayers. Most of us in the church have, we've, we've come to this place in the church where people pray, but they don't have a sound doctrine on how to pray. We know that much is going on in our world but a lot of us, like I said, we don't have a sound doctrine of how to pray. Number two, we have taken the message of love and twisted it. The apostles of old were prayer warriors. Where they knew when to express love and when to express judgment. So that's what I'm going to be dealing with right now, especially the biblical basis of praying judgmental prayers against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual weakness in high places. So Ephesians say we are not resting against flesh and blood. So when we're doing judgmental prayers, we're not sending this against human beings. We're sending it against spiritual wickedness, principalities, powers, wickedness in high places. But in this same Ephesians, it talks here about uh, rulers of darkness of this world. Um, these are people that have sold their soul to the devil and want to destroy humanity. If somebody partners with the devil to come against humanity, then we do not show mercy to those kind of people. And you can pray judgmental prayers against them. But this is one thing I want to say that even when you pray judgmental prayers, uh, you are not the one that judges the people. God is the ultimate judge. You might decree if we, if the, our judgmental prayers could kill people or just destroy people, a lot of people would have been destroyed because, you know, we human beings, you know, if somebody messes up with us or do something we don't like, it is very easy to release judgmental prayers or think evil about them and wish something bad upon them. But God does not go around taking all our evil wishes against people and acts upon them. 
So when God judges a situation or judges somebody in a situation, it is because those people are due for judgment. And if some people are not judged, the kingdom of God will not prosper. For example, what I'm saying by judgment is that, for example, if you walk into your house and somebody's raping your wife, you're not going to stand there and love them with the love of the Lord. You will give them immediate judgment. You punch them, you beat them up and everything before you even call the cops. And it will be, it will be okay because these people were doing something that was so way off. But if you walked in and somebody was raping your wife and you stand there and you don't defend your wife and you're loving them with the love for the Lord, oh, my brother, please just stop raping my wife. Jesus loves you. That is like out of, that is not going to be right. You know what I'm saying? So I want you to give you an example. If you go Apostle Paul, uh, if we go to the book of, of Apostle Paul is the one that wrote about love in the book of Corinthians. And uh, so when Apostle Paul wrote about love in the book of Corinthians, it was appropriate because we're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to love each other. Brethren in the church, we're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to love each other as um, children of God. We're supposed to even love those that have done wrong to us. You know, you're not supposed to carry on forgiveness and hatred because if you carry on forgiveness and hatred, if the Lord judges you by that, you're going to not make heaven. So I tell people, let, let go of unforgiveness, let go of hatred for human beings. Human beings are messed up. We are all broken and fallen creatures. And because we're broken and fallen creatures, we're apt to do wrong. So what I'm trying to say is that do not decide that. Do not cut fellow human beings a slack. Cut each other a slack. Remember do, too that you've done wrong in the past and people have forgiven you. God has forgiven you. So extend that same forgiveness to human beings. So that's what I would say. I'm not one of those people. I don't hold grudges. I don't hold people. I, I don't hold when people do wrong to me or the mess up. Yes, I don't hold grudges against them. I will tell them you've done this and then I don't hold grudges because to do that is actually like drinking poison and expecting the person to die. If you're holding hatred and unforgiveness towards somebody, it's like you drinking poison and expecting to them, the person to die. So that does not make sense. So if somebody has annoyed you, somebody has done wrong to you, please don't drink their poison. Yes, I know somebody broke your heart, but don't drink their poison. I know uh, somebody stole from you, the people that you trust that did you wrong, but don't drink their poison. Let it go so that your heart can be free with God because when you don't let go things like that, you stay in a cage and the same cage that you put yourself in is the same cage that will keep the Lord Jesus out. So that is one thing I'll talk about on forgiveness. So we're not resting against flesh and blood. So when I pray judgmental prayers, I'm not praying it against human beings per se. Um, being that we're a deliverance ministry, people come into our church all times that are witches and stuff like that. Usually I give them a chance. I love them. I show them the love of the Lord. I try to lead them to Christ. I try to pray deliverance over them. But if I see that they are not taking that and more and more trying to um, operate in the witchcraft and cause chaos in the church, I usually will call them after I give them about two to three months to decide whether do they want to serve God or they were just there to uh, as agents of darkness. And then I will call them and sit them down and tell them, this church is not for you. I've done that a few times. I've practically kicked witches out of my church. So I don't have a problem doing that, but I usually give them time knowing that they're human beings. And if they repent, God will forgive them. So uh, I want to say that so that that way everybody knows that when you pray judgmental prayers, you are not really praying it against human beings. You're praying it against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world. And if you don't pray those judgmental prayers, sometimes that means you are allowing the devil to rule the land, you know. So we want to be very, very certain about that, that, you know, if you read in the book of uh, Acts, you know, you know, book of Acts, there was a story in the book of Acts in Acts 13. In Acts 13 uh, verse um, 7. No, let's start to verse 4. This is about Saul and Barnabas. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Ghost, departed to Cilicia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they had, were at Salami, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews and also known to John their minister. When they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus. Bar Jesus means son of Jesus. So what did they do? They found a Jew, they found a false prophet, and his name was son of Jesus. What did this prophet do? They attached themselves to the deputy of the county, Sergius Palos, 
a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him and said, O, said, o, thou, o thou full of all subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, would thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind for a season, not seeing the sun for a season. Immediately a mist fell upon him, and he became blind. And then verse 12, and the deputy, when he saw this was done, believed, astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So we see several things here. Apostle Paul comes to, to Paphos. The deputy wants to hear the gospel. When the deputy hears the gospel, that means the gospel would have entered the whole of Paphos. So there was a witch that attached himself to the deputy, trying to turn him away from the gospel. Apostle Paul did not love him with the love of the Lord. Apostle Paul judged him. So in this situation, you would have decided, was it more righteous for Apostle Paul to love this guy and then let all the souls in Paphos perish? Or it was right for Apostle Paul to judge this guy so righteousness can reign in Paphos? That is what we're talking about. So Apostle Paul judged Elimas with blindness. And when this judgment happened, he so shocked the the deputy council he saw the power of god in manifestation and what did he do it's he said wow he was astonished he received christ he was astonished at what at the doctrine of the lord so judging elimas with judgment judging elimas was considered the doctrine of the lord you know what i'm saying so it is time when we start seeing that sometimes releasing judgment upon the enemy that is Blocking a city, causing chaos, causing, taking the souls of people to hell, you know, um, trafficking children and all that stuff. Judging the human beings can actually be the judgment of the Lord. And remember, it is the Lord that does the judgment, not you. So if God can judge Elimas, are we now more righteous than God? If God himself can say, go into Jericho, kill everybody because he knows who they are. He knows who they are spiritually. He knows that if the children are survived, what they're going to do in the future. He said, kill everybody in, the Jericho, in Jericho. Kill every animal. Kill all of them. You know something? I'm like, what kind of God is going to kill everybody in Jericho, including the children? Well, this is the good news. When children, children below the age of recognition of who God is or making decisions for themselves die, they have a one-way ticket to heaven. So the children... If they die in infancy or maybe two, three, four years old before they have a knowledge of sin and everything, they actually have a straight path to heaven. So that might not have been such a bad thing for the children of Jericho. But there was a lot of stuff evil going on in Jericho and the Lord judged them. And you know what? When God says judge them, it is God that does the judgment. When the children of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and they shouted, the wall of Jericho came down. It was a supertonic sound. But Rahab's house that was also on the wall was actually preserved. So the angels of the living God pushed down the wall and then they preserved Rahab's house. But who did that? It was not the people that were marching. The human beings had no power to bring down a wall. It was God. It was the angels of God that did that. So I want to get people to recognize that judgment is done by God. But because God does not do things until we say something if we allow evil to rule in our land and we don't judge evil god is not going to do anything you're like well god why don't you judge them god is waiting for you to decree it and he will establish it and there are times when you would decree judgment and god will not establish it because what the iniquity of those people are not full god waits for the iniquity to be full before he releases judgment and i'm going to give you another scripture if you go in the book of isaiah 54 I want to teach everybody to know that this battle, the reason why we're going through so much is because the church that has the power to decree and is established is scared to judge the enemy. If you read in Isaiah 54 verse 17, and we all know the scripture, it says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment you will condemn. 
God is saying that if their tongues rising up against the church, against God, they should be condemned in what? Judgment. Don't sit down and be crying when these tongues are rising up against you. If a witch sends an arrow of darkness or a bewitchment or a spell against you, you should send it back. You should judge them back. And when you do that, two things are going to happen. If they receive judgment, they're going to repent because they'll be like, wow, we've seen power that is greater than our own power. The second thing that can happen is that if God feels that their iniquity is full, God will take them out. But God is the one that makes those decisions. We only decree judgment. We speak righteousness over the land and we speak judgment over wickedness. And that is the honor God has given to every Christian. And let me, to every saint, to every, of, to every, let me take you to the book of Psalms, Psalm 149. And this is a scripture that every child of God has to read and know because it is our fault that all this craziness is reigning. You know what I'm saying? We should not, we should judge drug dealers that when we judge drug dealers, you're not judging, you're judging them that when they see that judgment, they will release the souls of people and they will either get saved or whatever happens to them, that's fine. There are some people that have to, would, that there's, there are some people that will have to die for righteousness to reign. And if that happens, then God makes those decisions. So um, Psalm 149 verse 5 says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishment upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. So this is what God is telling us that we need to execute upon the enemy the judgment written. This honor have all saints. We as saints have the honor to execute the judgment written upon the enemy. And when we don't do that, the devil runs rampant and does whatever he wants to do. So it is our fault that the world is going crazy like this. And let me take you to Psalm 2. Like I said, just look at scripture. And when you understand this, then you're going to be able to rise up as a true warrior and be God's battle axe and not just sitting down and letting the enemy rule and reign in your life. Uh, Psalm 2 says, in, uh, Psalm 2 says, why do the hidden rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth, they set themselves and the rulers, they take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands and cast their, away their cords from them. He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. So now, if you go to verse 8, it says, ask of me. We, God says we should ask of him and I shall give you the hidden for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. That is the judgment. When the kings of the earth, the rulers of this world, they sit together and they decide that they're going to destroy humanity. Our job as saints is to judge them by the judgment written in the word of God. We say here that the Bible says here that we will break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Wow, that is God speaking. That is, I did not write that. So if God is saying judge them, we need to declare that judgment so that when they gather together, they sit together to take counsel against us, wicked things against us. What do we do? We break them with a rod of iron. You dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. I'm not saying take a rod of iron and go track down somebody and beat them. These are spirit. These things that happen in the physical, in the Bible, happen in the spiritual in, in our time. So if you see the spirit of Herod, the spirit of Herod was, this, sorry, if you see the spirit of Pharaoh was killing newborn babies, what happened? Pharaoh wanted to drown the children of Israel. They wanted to push them in the Red Sea and drown them. But God came and God fought for the children of Israel. What happened? The, the cloud came behind and stood there. The same cloud was giving light to the children of Israel as the sea was being parted all night. But to the, to the people of Pharaoh, they were having like, you know, just turned down, you know, just a storm that was harassing them. And when the sea, when they woke up in the morning, the children of Israel were walking down this dry path in the middle of the sea. If I were Pharaoh, I would not have followed them. But sometimes God gives people, you know, demonic foolishness to do things that don't make sense. Because to Pharaoh, you don't know what was holding the water. So why are you following them? But he did. When Pharaoh started following them, God started taking off the wheels of Pharaoh's chariots. Today's Christians who probably helped put the wheels back and 
reassure Pharaoh that God is love. In the love of God, judgment is part of that love. Part of love is judging evil. If you don't judge evil, then you allow evil to grow and prosper. That is not love. So God is the one that took up their chariots and opened the sea and drowned them. God drowned Pharaoh. Was it Moses that actually pushed them in the ocean? Was it Mo Moses lifted up of this thing and the sea parted? The Bible said the east wind blew all night. So the wind of God blew. It was the Holy Spirit that blew that wind. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. Blew the wind all night. And by morning, Pharaoh's army was drowned. So God drowned Pharaoh's army because they were pursuing the children of Israel relentlessly. You're going to have some enemies that are pursuing you relentlessly that you have to drown in the Red Sea. So right now we're at a, we're at a time as humanity where the elites and some of them are not human. They have decided that they would destroy us. They've decided that we are useless feeders. The, it's time for the church, the sleeping giant called the church, to rise up and judge this wickedness. To rise up and judge them. And before we judge them, there are steps that you're going to have to take to be ready to be in this position to judge the enemy. Because you can't just judge the enemy when you don't have what it takes. You can't judge the enemy when you yourself are not living right. You can't judge the enemy when your cracks are broken. You cannot fight Pharaoh in Pharaoh's court. So in my, so in my next segment, I'll be talking about how to, to prepare yourself to be able to decree judgment, to prepare yourself to fight this battle and not be a casualty. But remember, it is our honor as saints to judge wickedness. And if we don't do that, and if you go through the Bible, you pick out wickedness the way God judges wickedness in the Bible and judge them. The Bible says in Isaiah 9, Isaiah 8 verse 9, says, As you say to yourself, O ye people, you shall be broken into pieces. Give ear, O ye country, far country, God yourself, you shall be broken into pieces. God expects you to judge wickedness by commanding their coffins to be broken into pieces. So we're going to be back in the next segment just telling you now how you can prepare yourself to be able to be to decree judgment by the enemy. God bless you.